Okay, welcome everyone. We are so pleased that you're with us today. We'll take down our hold slide. There it is. And uh, we're, we're very uh, pleased this morning to welcome all of you to the Council of the Americas for our first program, hopefully of many, on the Ninth Summit of the Americas, which the United States will host in 2021. I'm Steve Liston, Senior Director at the County DC. And I'm pleased to serve as host and moderator today for a group of true experts on the summit process and longtime friends of the Council of the Americas. Before I introduce our speakers today, I'd like to give the floor to my partner in crime in putting this program together, Maria Selena Conte, Acting Director of the Summits of the Americas Secretariat at the OAS. Maria Selena, thanks for your collaboration and the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. It's really a pleasure. And on behalf of the uh, Organization of American States, in particular, the Summit uh, of the America Secretariat, we are really very pleased to hold uh, this joint session with the Council of the Americas, whom I would like to thank for this important initiative. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I am very honored to welcome today such distinguished uh, speakers. The current chair of the summit uh, process, represented by the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Hemispheric Affairs, Mr. Kevin O'Reilly, uh, as well as the former chair, uh, the ambassador of Peru to the United States, Hugo de Sela, and the secretary uh, for Hemispheric Affairs of the OAS, Ambassador James Lambert. Also, I would like to recognize the participation of the audience that is following us today, including government representatives, the private sector, and multilateral organizations. Today, we will hear from three important perspectives on the summit process, such as the current and former chair and the OEAS as the secretariat of this process. We will use uh, the previously distributed uh, economic growth document as base uh, document for this meeting. The Summit of the Americas, as you know, is a forum for political uh, discussion where hemispheric agreements and mandates are adopted. It is the member states who fulfill these mandates. And with this in mind, in order to create a stronger and more resilient front in the growth of the region, private sector is called to act in full coordination with their government to effectively translate the mandates into national uh, policies. Uh, on all fronts of the hemispheric agenda, private sector will play a key role in the implementation of future summit mandates. The preparation phase of the ninth summit uh, of the Americas, as we all know, is taking place in the middle of a pandemic, which several countries in the region have been severely affected. The health crisis has evolved into a socioeconomic emergency, and in some countries, it has even found its way into areas of governance. Now more than ever, the region can highly benefit from a committed uh, private sector. This uh, will be the most uh, or the more impactful uh, or will be uh, more impactful since uh, the resources and cooperation responses from the international community during the recovery uh, stage of the pandemic will be limited. Uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to highlight that the Lima Commitment Democratic Governance Against Corruption, which was adopted at the A Summit of the Americas in 2018 until the, under the leadership of the Peruvian uh, government, outlines very clear objectives related to the regional anti-corruption agenda, which should be continuously worked on since the intent and viability of the agenda has not culminated. The COVID-19 uh, crisis has generated new challenges in terms basically of transparency and integrity in government institutions, emphasizing the risk of corruption in the management of resources for mitigating the effects of state crisis. During the recovery phase of this pandemic, it will be necessary to deepen the core of the anti-corruption agenda in which the involvement of the private sector is indispensable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Selena. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, your cooperation with us at the Council and in getting this program together and going forward. We look forward to it. Thank you for your words. So I'm going to briefly introduce our three speakers today, and I'll be brief both because uh, they are all well known to all of us and because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions today. 
Our first speaker is Ambassador James Lambert, Secretary for Hemispheric Affairs at the OAS. Ambassador Lambert has held this position since 2015. Prior to joining the OAS, he served as a Canadian diplomat for 33 years. His postings included Costa Rica, Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and he served as Director General of Latin America and the Caribbean in Ottawa. Welcome, Ambassador Lambert. Our second speaker uh, is Ambassador Hugo de Sela, Ambassador of the Republic of Peru to the United States. Prior to taking up his current post in April last year, Ambassador de Sela has served as Peru's Vice Foreign Minister, where he managed the Peruvian government's hosting of the Eighth Summit of the Americas. Over his 42 years of diplomatic service, he has served as permanent representative to the OAS, ambassador to Brazil and Argentina, and as Chief of Staff at the Secretariat General of the OAS, not once, but twice. So no one better to help us understand the transition from the eighth to the ninth summit of the Americas. Welcome, Ambassador Lissetta. And our third speaker is Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Kevin O'Reilly. Mr. O'Reilly is a career diplomat whose postings include Mexico City, Santo Domingo, Buenos Aires, and Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge d'Affaires in Panama. In Washington, in addition to a number of Western Hemisphere positions at the State Department, he has served at the National Security Council, the Pentagon, the Department of Homeland Security, and on the Hill. Thank you for joining us today. Our goal today is to understand the process that is taking us from the Lima Summit in 2018 to the U.S. Summit next year. What came out of the Lima Summit and lessons learned from what was, by all accounts, an important and successful event and what the United States government is doing and planning as host of the ninth summit. Each of our speakers will offer about 10 minutes of remarks. And after that, I will moderate a panel with the three and I would be happy to take questions from the attendees. If you have a question you would like me to put to our speakers, please send a chat to me. I'm listed as the presenter and I will be happy to pass it along. If you would like me to identify you by name and organization, please be sure to include those in your question. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Ambassador Lambert. Ambassador, thank you again for being with us today. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, and to your colleagues at the Council and Maria Salina uh, for this uh, excellent and timely initiative as we enter the preparatory phase of the Ninth Summit of the Americas. And it's a pleasure to uh, be on such a distinguished panel together with friends and colleagues, uh, Das, uh, Kevin O'Reilly from State Department and Ambassador Hugo de Sela, who really was uh, uh, very critically responsible for the delivery of the last Summit of the Americas held in Lima in 2018. Uh, the ninth Summit of the Americas, uh, as Maria Salina has alluded to, takes place at a critical moment in the hemisphere. It comes at a time when the countries of the region are still battling the hugely devastating effects of the pandemic, which are impacting on the health and well-being of the countries of the region. But it also poses major risks that could reverse the progress in economic development and democratic governance that we've put in place over the last 20 years. So my colleagues are well placed to talk about the results of the last summit and the prospects for the next one. And I thought that I might pick up some of the high points of the process to date, which has enjoyed both periods of success and some, to be frank, notable failures uh, along its pathway as well. And I'd uh, like to review who exactly are the participants and contributing parties to the summit process and what are the instruments and tools that we have at our disposal to ensure, first of all, that the summits enjoy a wide buy-in and credibility. And second, that the participating countries not only agree on the critical priorities, but to implement the un undertakings that they have agreed upon. So the OAS is the official secretary to the summit process and has a key role in assisting the, the, the host country in addressing these challenges, both in the preparatory phase leading up to the summit, but also equally importantly, in the implementation phase after the summit. And as an organization, we in the OAS have an important stake in the outcome and I would say never more so than at this time when there's a broad questioning about the value added of collaborative multilateral approaches. So there is no doubt in my own mind that the recovery prospects in the region 
are going to be markedly improved if we use multilateral tools to identify and impl uh, implement best practices in the area of health, sanitary, and economic sectors. But it also presents us with a unique opportunity to step back and address what are the structural weaknesses in the region that have left us particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to the pandemic, including pervasive inequality, economic informality, limited fiscal headroom, or poorly articulated channels for expanding trade and investment in the region. These are important challenges. So the important question therefore is, is the summits up to this challenge? And if you will permit me, I'll take a short historical detour and show that over the past quarter century, um, there have been periods where the required discipline and coherence has been present, but arguably only sporadically. Why is this the case? This is important to identify these factors so that we can ensure that the summits are up to the task at this critical juncture. Well, the problem to the extent that it exists lies to a degree in the heterogeneity of the Americas, not only in ethnicity, language, levels of development, but also political systems and ideology. And what is further complicated matters is that the area is, one could say, not only diverse, but at times perverse. And that is to say, without making light of it, that um, it, 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 there have been periods where th there's been a willingness to privilege ideological posturing over pragmatic collaboration, even if it has come at the cost to our citizenry. And th this is not to say that important outcomes are necessarily going to be frustrated, but rather that the success in using the summits to implement real change has really been a function of the ability of the host nation to find a theme that will unite these disparate elements and be able to pursue consensus through diplomacy. So following this logic, the history of leader-led summitry in the Americas falls roughly into three phases, each of which had a different level of ambition and a different level of success. The first began more than a quarter of a century ago with the first summit of the Americas in Miami, and it went to roughly the fourth summit held at Mar de Plata, Argentina in 2005. And in this period, the summits postulated and initiated an ambitious process for regional economic integration known as the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas. And although this initiative ultimately foundered on the rocks of ideological division, it did lead to a 10-year period of systematic negotiation, which did much to improve the capacity of the governments in the region uh, in dealing with the complexity of trade and investment policy. And in fact, in the decade in, that followed, that expertise led Chile, Peru, Mexico, Costa Rica, Canada, the United States to rapidly open a wide range of bilateral and regional free trade initiatives, including important initiatives such as the Pacific Alliance. However, at best, the summit can only claim indirect paternal responsibility uh, for these efforts, as I've suggested. And in fact, the first decade of summitry was much more successful at, at pursuing and improving common practices in the areas of democratic governance and the coherence of the inter-American system than it was in laying the foundation for regional economic integration. I think most noteworthy in that regard uh, was the agreement in Miami to negotiate the world's first regional instrument on uh, corruption, you know, the Inter-American Convention on Corruption and its uh, implementation mechanism known as MESI-SIC. Well, evidently that treaty has not ended the scourge of corruption in the region, but the evolution of collaborative mutually agreed frameworks, the possibility of peer review has elevated the quality of the legislative frameworks that exist in the region, as well as the independence of judicial and prosecutorial branches uh, as they address these problems. And in my view, it's really unlikely that the Odebrecht scandal or the Panama Papers would have come to light without the gradual adoption over this period of the institutional and legislative frameworks that were contemplated in that convention, which was born of the first summit of the Americas. The other important success born of the initial robust period of summitry was the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which was negotiated at the instruction of leaders at the Quebec summit in 2001. And it now stands really as the cornerstone and benchmark of democratic practice in our region. I think Quebec uh, was important also in developing a summit practice that saw these meetings as more than a series of one-off encounters. And the role of the OAS as a technical secretariat to the process was strengthened at that time, as was the capacity to record the compliance of participating countries with the mandates that were established by leaders. 
And importantly, it recognized that in order to accomplish these truly transformative uh, agendas, they were not going to be delivered by governments alone. And so that gave rise to channels to incorporate the, in, uh, the input of important partners, outside sources of expertise, both in the private sector and civil society, and as well in the inter-American system of multilateral institutions. So that then led us into the second and perhaps less successful period of the summit's process, uh, coinciding with the emergence of uh, governments of the Bolivarian uh, movement or ALBA as expressions of uh, ideological actions that ran contrary to the perceived common values of representative democracy and economic liberalization, which had been set out at my, Miami and Quebec. And I hasten to say that I, I do not say this in a critical or judgmental fashion. The countries themselves would, I think, agree with that statement. And these countries also postulated and organized alternate forums of hemispheric or regional integration, such as UNASUR and CELAC, which were established explicitly to consolidate sub-regional solidarity, but implicitly as a challenge to the legitimacy of the summit process and the OAS as its technical secretariat. As a result, for a period of about a decade, covering the summits of Mar de Plata uh, in 2005, Trinidad and Tobago in 2009, Cartagena 2012, and Panama in 2015, the meetings didn't give rise to mandates that could be agreed or promulgated by leaders on a consensus basis. Uh, nor were there really important instructions to the inter-American system or to the participating countries to negotiate innovative or ambitious new instruments or agreements to address the emerging problems in the region. Um, it's not to say that there was no value added accrued from getting leaders together over this period, and in particular, the participation of the private sector with the collaboration of the IDP over this period became an ever more prominent focus of the events, uh, including with a parallel CEO forum and the development of the America's Business Dialogue as a channel for businesses, large and small, to communicate their concerns to regional leadership. And the OAS over this period has been at pains to improve the engagement of civil society. And I'm happy to address this in the question period if there are specific issues about how this was accomplished. But still, the absence of consensus at the level of leaders uh, prevented this from translating into a more ambitious set of outcomes, leaving business and civil society participants frustrated as well. So I don't want to leave here the impression that ideological unanimity is a prerequisite for a successful summit or leader-led diplomacy. It's not the case in the EU, it's not the case in the APEC region or others where this kind of diplomacy is practiced. And the third period of the summit process coinciding with Peru's assumption of the chair in 2016 shows this to be the case. Because the region after that point certainly did not become less diverse or turbulent but for a variety of reasons, under Peru's able diplomatic stewardship, the countries of the region were the first time in for 13 years able to reach consensus on summit outcomes. And primary among the reasons for this was the identification of a single theme, in this case, democratic governance against corruption, which was undeniably of the moment and of indisputable consequence. The outcomes and follow-up mechanisms agreed were also tangible and measurable. So in conclusion, because I, I don't want to rob the thunder of Ambassador uh, Dizella, who can speak better than I about the Lima commitments on democratic governance against corruption, which was were adopted at the eighth summit of the Americas. And I, I don't want to uh, go into the current set of challenges that faces the USA as host of the ninth summit of the Americas, except to say that given the exceptional clarity about the dimensions of the crisis we face, uh, the requirements for a coordinated response there can be no doubt, I think, about the pertinence of this multilateral tool in addressing it and about our willingness to assist the host in doing so. I think given the diplomatic assets that the USA brings to this task as it hosts the summit, uh, I'm optimistic that we're going to see not only a successful and meaningful summit, but one that will strengthen the process of collaboration that we enjoy with partners in the private sector, civil society, and the inter-American multilateral system in delivering a successful summit next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Lambert. Thanks for giving us that great overview. Uh, very complex process uh, that ongoing all the time. So now I'd like to turn the floor over to Ambassador De Sella. Ambassador. Thank you very much. It's also a pleasure for me to be here in this panel with uh, two very dear friends to whom I know from some time ago. Well, let me tell you something about the, the, the summit in Lima. Uh, 
As you know, one very important aspect of the success we had was, as Ambassador Lambert said, the choosing of one single issue as the dominant theme of the summit, because that allowed the heads of the state to concentrate on giving their countries some specific mandates about one issue without precluding their capacity to speak another uh, about another different issue. So that's something that proved uh, successful. As you know, and um, as Ambassador Lambert said, after 13 years of summit, we were able to uh, get together the countries to make a commitment, the, the, the commitment about democratic governance against corruption. That we think was extremely important because we did uh, try to have these mandates uh, written on a very specific way, not as you are used to see in, in, in these kind of gatherings, general uh, uh, phrases, general commitments. These were very specific. If you take the time to review the, the Lima commitment, you, you will see that. No, and, and I think that that was uh, also important. We decided to uh, centralize discussions on this issue of corruption because of the obvious need of having a, a regional approach to this issue. Uh, we have several examples that have shown that this is a scourge that you cannot fight alone. You need the cooperation of the countries to do something about it. Another uh, important aspect of uh, the decisions uh, presidents took in Lima was to have a follow-up mechanism. That's extremely important because, in my opinion, that's one of the main weaknesses the Summit of the Americas as a process has. Because the follow-up mechanism is indispensable to put into practice the decision of the heads of, of the state. I hope that our friends of, of the United States take that into account in this summit, because it, there is the need of uh, work more in these follow-up uh, processes. In, in any case, what we did in the, in the Lima Summit was try uh, to create a digital platform, a website in, in practical terms, in which states and institutions of the uh, member countries of the summit can update their uh, their progress in fulfilling the 57 commitments we agreed to. That website is uh, open to the general public. Anyone can access to, to that. Is uh, any representative of civil society, the private sector, citizenship in general can access to, to, to that uh, website and see what and every country is doing uh, in the fight against corruption. And we included also another aspect, which I think is important, which is a bank of good practices and technical capabilities to promote cooperation in the fight, in the fight against corruption in our region. We are going to make a brief presentation on, on the summit hearing in the United States about the advances we have had uh, towards the achievement of the goals that the presidents agreed in, in Lima. Now, two, two more aspects I want to highlight from the uh, meeting in Lima. One was a greater participation of civil society. That was extremely important. We were able to organize that in a way that allowed civil society in, in their different expressions to have in-depth discussions about the, the, the corruption issue, and specifically to make a presentation directly to the head of state. That was, that was kind of an uh, innovation in, in, in the 
uh, summit process. And they were, uh, as they told us, very happy about it because it allowed them to have a direct interchange with the heads of, of the state. So that, that was uh, something very uh, successful at that time. And a second aspect that I want to highlight is the participation of the private sector. On that, I have to recognize that the Inter-American Development Bank played a very substantive role because they did organize the meeting of the business sector. They linked that meeting with the main goals of the uh, summit process and was extremely successful to have the input of uh, that side of the political spectrum, I mean the, the, the private sector. That I think uh, was one of the keys for success in uh, the, the meeting of Lima. The, the CEO's uh, summit of, of the Americas brought together more than 1,000 representatives from more than 300 business institutions in the region. So I hope that we will continue working uh, in, in, in having also now in the United States this uh, private sector uh, meeting. No? They even got to agree on a private sector commitment to transparency, which, which was a very powerful message to our societies of the commitment of the uh, private sector towards fight against uh, corruption. No? Um, I understand that uh, the past week, the, uh, uh, the IDB launched a, also a digital platform for the private sector to evaluate the progress in fulfilling the recommendations included in the action plan. I would encourage, uh, uh, encourage our friends of the private sector to take a look at that uh, digital platform and maybe uh, cooperate with, with that. That, that would be interesting. Now, eh, briefly, I, I want to refer to, to the links between uh, the Lima Summit and the summit here in the United States, the, between the eighth and ninth uh, summit. Um, we welcome, we are really happy that the US presidency of the, of the summit has proposed three areas of focus in the road to the ninth summit. No? They, they have spoke about economic growth and job creation, democracy and good governance, and transparency. We think that that's a, a very good way of following up with what uh, the presidents did in the, in the past uh, summit. It gives us a framework to try to work together and to do something that I think is essential to the summit, to see them as a continuous process. We cannot go from summit to summit, uh, changing all the time the uh, dialogue between the presidents. There has to be an, an element of continuity. That, that I think it's important. So if we put together this general idea of continuity in the discussions, and a good follow-up mechanism through the OES, through the bodies of the OES, of the mandates of the presidents, I think we are in a good way to ensure that the decisions by the presidents are put into practice. So going into that, uh, the Lima commitment, including some specific mandates, about uh, issues that are coincident also with the paper that the Council of the Americas and that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce put into consideration for, for uh, the conversation we are having today. Let me uh, tell you specifically that I see coincidences in ideas such as promotion of open government, digital governance, open data, transparency, 
open budgets, electronic procurement, the use of one-stop shops, and public registration of state suppliers. All of these are commitments that were included in uh, the decisions in Lima. So I see uh, in a very uh, uh, promising way that uh, this paper of a, that you presented for consideration today is kind of a follow-up of, the, of these uh, commitments. No? So what I think is that now we can see a concrete road to promote institutional modernization, digital government, and administrative simplification. No? I think that's really important. Uh, let me say something also. In the international community, I think the Americas are giving a very powerful message because in the United Nations, we did also some follow-up of the meeting and we sponsored together with Colombia, a request for a special session of the General Assembly against corruption that is going to take place next year. Uh, and we uh, are working on that and trying to uh, send a message from the Americas to the world in the sense that this is a, a very important issue. So, so you see that when the American countries are able to commit to something, we can really make a difference. And the proof is this meeting of the United Nations that will get together countries of everywhere. No? Uh, Finally, I would like to, to emphasize that as our friends from United States know, and especially Kevin, uh, we are in Peru really, really in a very good disposition to work together because we are sure that the next summit in the United States is going to be a success. One final word, something that we all should bear in mind. We cannot expect that the host country is the only one responsible for the success of the summit. The summit is successful when we all together commit to work and to make what's necessary to achieve our goals. So in that sense, the participation, not only of government, but the participation of the private sector of civil society is essential to the success of the summit. And with this, I finish for now and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, Ambassador Desella. Appreciate your remarks. And I'm going to turn it over now to Das O'Reilly, please. Thanks much, Steve. And thanks, um, Maria Serena and, and, and Jamie. Ambassador Desella. summit of um, uh, 2018. Uh, we hope to be able to uh, jump at least as high as, um, as, as Peru did uh, for that event. Um, I'll start off with some of the, um, the most basic question. So uh, when are you guys going to hold this thing? And uh, where do you think you're going to hold this thing? Uh, what I will say is that um, it's been an interesting 2020. We've had a pandemic. We have our own um, domestic calendar, which no doubt you're aware of. So watch this space. We will, um, we will, I look forward to being able to work with folks and to, uh, to be able to make that announcement as soon as possible. Um, we're in different circumstances than we were in 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 2018 we got some new challenges um, um but we also have as as um, as you were saying we'll go some of <coughs> some strong elements of continuity um we want to work together to respond to um the challenges of uh of corruption and to respond to the authoritarian 
challenge that exists in the hemisphere. And we want to be able to work together to um, make our own uh, democratic institutions as robust as they possibly can be. And that means um, also uh, extending beyond the political rights to civil and, and human uh, rights as well. But what we have now in the foreground uh, for us all is an extraordinary um, uh, public health set of public health challenges. Um, uh, this pandemic uh, has uh, is going to face us over the course of the next year with not only uh, responding to the uh, immediate demands for a therapeutic response for so many of our citizens to uh, we're facing the pandemic, but also we're going to have to bring um, uh, vaccination regimes to um, to the citizenry across the hemisphere, and we're going to have to explain uh, the requirements for that. Um, we're going to have to build confidence in that. Many of our governments have been taking on an extraordinary amount of debt, and as Jamie, as you mentioned before, there's going to be a limited ceiling to how much they can um, they can bear, um, and we all have to focus on the economic recovery which um, our citizens demand. And um, we have to take a hard look at the effects um, that this has had, this shock has had on our, our societies and, and of course on our, um, uh, our um, uh, economies. Um, I mentioned briefly the authoritarian challenge. Look, long before this, uh, current pandemic, um, I was working with colleagues like Uwe Sela and others from across the region um, dealing with the externalities uh, of what's been going on these past years in Venezuela. Uh, it's not just. It's obviously a question of the rights and the basic dignity of the citizens of Venezuela, but also of the migration that this has imposed uh, on the region, the migration pressures and the public health pressures. It was Peru itself over a year and a half ago that was organizing um, a, a, um, a meeting of health ministers, an initial health meeting of ministers, to deal with all the other externalities and the fact that people who are sick and who are on the move become vectors for disease, not through any fault of their own, but because of the circumstances in which they find themselves. And we have to figure out ways to respond to that as well. If I was going to leave one message with folks today, is it's really just a theme that both um, Ambassadors Lambert and Gazella touched on. We're kind of midstream. We're roughly, uh, maybe a little more than halfway because of the pandemic, but we're about halfway between the the follow-on of um, uh, the summit uh, in Lima and the preparations uh, for the summit that we will host. Um, so please um, take a look at where we are. Take a look at the papers that have been posted on the summit's secretariat, um, uh, its own website. Take a look at the commitments that Ambassador Vizela was, uh, was referring to. Take a look at where we are, where we are and jump into the debate. Uh, help us uh, construct within that broad framework that uh, Ambassador Sela referred to the agenda uh, for our governments uh, and their leadership uh, for the summit to come. That's one of the processes that we're committed to as we develop sort of refine the theme that we as hosts want to put in front of other leaders in the region and to the region as a whole. Because it, it isn't just an event. Uh, this is about the process, as, as both the uh, earlier speakers have said. And we learned a lot of this from Peru's experience. This focus on democratic governance, transparency, and corruption, the Lima commitments themselves, came out of a process of consultations and listening to the voices from uh, other governments, but from also from the outside of governments. And um, that's one reason that, that we asked um, the summit's 
secretariat to circulate to national summit coordinators uh, a series of um, uh, concept papers, two from U.S.-based uh, groups, and we we have to thank the, the council and the and the chamber uh, for uh, their paper on the economic agenda, and uh, one from the the broader swath of groups that uh, form the joint summit um, working group and from across the region. Now we want to hear. Um, the feedback from governments, and we, um, uh, we've suggested to our counterparts that they do similar. To the, actually, you both referred to the American business, the America's business dialogue, hosted over at the, uh, the IVB, and um, it's recommendation, you know, it made recommendations in Panama, it made recommendations in Lima through the CEO summit. We think it was um, a great innovation, and we hope to deepen that engagement as we um, we look forward. This process, and and we've heard some mention of it already, has impact. It makes uh, it, it makes sometimes fitful, perhaps, but it makes uh, real progress for us here in this hemisphere. The in April 2001, the Quebec summit, um, our leaders entered into a commitment that we then were able to uh, bring to fruition in September of that year with the Inter American Democratic Charter. Um, it has, um, uh, as you know, experienced diplomatic hands like you, Steve, like the ambassadors and others here. It has made a real difference in helping the inter-American system and the governments in this region and the citizens of our hemisphere defend fundamental democratic principles. It isn't always easy, but it is a major step forward. And I, uh, you stole my thunder, Ambassador. I was going to mention as well that the out, one of the fundamental we speak with a, a powerful voice. I, it, it looks like it'll be in April, sometime this spring, anyhow, this uh, UN General Assembly special session on corruption. It changed the conversation in the region and in a very positive way. And we should not uh, underestimate its, um, its impact. Um, one final thing, um, since I know we're speaking to lots of um, private sector um, uh, interested parties here in, in our conversation. We also want to look for real diversity of the sectors who lend their voice to this conversation. Um, and different sectors of the economy, uh, the size and scope and reach of the participating firms. But yes, particularly in the moments we face right now, with a real emphasis on growth an opportunity for the citizens of this region. This is, we're going to be coming out of a very rough patch here, and we need to be creative in order to give back to people the dignity of work that they deserve. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, all of you. Super. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you for uh, these great comments. I've Send a chat, but just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please send me uh, a note and I will be happy to pass along. Please do identify yourself and your organization uh, if you want me to ask a question on your behalf. Uh, I am going to start out uh, with uh, a question for all three of you. And, um, and that is based on my experience in the private sector, which is a lot of businesses say, you know, summits, what are they good for, right? Just a big uh, get together, photo op. Um, and, and so my question to all three of you based on your experience is summits, what are they good for? That is, what what is it that summits can be expected to achieve? What is it that they shouldn't be expected to achieve? Multilateral summits are a very unique type of meeting. Uh, and, and what should businesses expect to, uh, to see coming out of a summit or how can they make the most of a summit uh, based on your experience? So let me actually turn to Ambassador Tesela first um, and see if you would like to comment and then we'll go to the others for any comments you'd like to make. Ambassador, based on your 
um, on your experience at the Lima Summit, and you're still on mute, so be sure to unmute, please. Yes, with pleasure. Two or three comments. One, as I said, is not up only to one sector to make the summit useful. The summit is successful if you have adequate inputs for the presidents to make a decision. So, if we have a private sector active in the preparation, making a specific proposal, if you have a civil society doing the same, and if you have government having a good preparation of the meeting, then the meeting of the presidents can be useful because the presidents will make a specific decision. That's one factor. A second factor is the follow-up. You cannot let the president make a decision and then forget about it until the next meeting of the summit. You have to have work between the summits. That's another key for success. Three, you have to have a commitment to try to focus on one or two issues and not have a lot of issues to discuss because that's a recipe for failure. Uh, those are my main ideas I can amplify, but I think we are short in time. So I leave it like that. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Lost my mute button. Um, I will share the uh, the uh, link. I've been asked to share the link that Ambassador Isela mentioned. It's americasbd.org. And I will put that in the chat for everybody uh, as well. Um, uh, Ambassador Lambert, you want to comment on that? What are summits good for? Anything to add to what Ambassador Isela had to say? Well, just very quickly, uh, I, I think uh, Ambassador Isela uh, spelled out with regard to to Lima that, uh, I mean, summits are, are good for, you know, if they hone in on a relevant theme at setting the agenda. And they they're, they also give recognition that's important in the, in the region, that there is an active and dynamic approach to dealing. So when we're facing a crisis as we are now, it's important that leaders get together and, 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 and do so. Part of the problem is that summits meet only sporadically in, in, our, in our region. So uh, it's a bit, it's a bit epi episodic but they also have to set out a real and detailed work plan in doing that. If, if it's all pie in the sky, um, niceties about what we would like to achieve, but it's not anchored with a, a work plan that can then be given to the institutions of the inter-American system, the Joint Summit Working Group, civil society partners, the business sector and others, uh, th there's a uh, little likelihood that it's going to generate meaningful uh, results as we have seen in the past on the Convention on Corruption, the Inter-American Inter Democratic Charter, which have been great successes. If, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna offer the Goldilocks option here. Um, somewhere that's, uh, I find myself somewhere in between here on the observations. Um, Um, but focus on your particular pet rock. Focus on particular principles that will help advance, uh, uh, in this case, um, economic priorities. What are the underlying foundations? You'll see that allow um, for a, a consensus develop across the region, but B, that can create specific actions in different political contexts. Wow. The Inter-American Democratic Charter did that. Um, the, uh, the focus on transparency and corruption coming out of Lima is doing that. Um, it's not necessarily the forum to focus on a particularly specific frustration or grievance or concern of a particular sector of the economy uh, because you're talking to too broad an audience. But if you can focus on first principles, now you're talking. Now you're giving summits 
something that they can chew on and you're creating an opportunity um, for action, sort of giving someone a lever so they can move the world. And that was my dog, sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, I have a question here about um, how the, um, the summit can build on the economic, developmental, and other diversity in the Americas to have an inclusive outcome in dealing with post-pandemic recovery. Obviously, one of the big questions that we've all been facing is the issue of inclusive growth, the issue of this K-shaped recovery, as we're calling it, where some are doing fine and some are not doing well. How, how do we make sure that going forward, what can the summit do specifically to help us move in the, in the right direction in terms of uh, the recovery um, and making sure that it's truly inclusive, that, that everyone has the opportunity to do better going forward? Uh, let me start uh, with you, Ambassador Lambert, if you have thoughts based on your experience. Uh, sure. Well, I would just uh, uh, quickly mention that uh, you know, aside from when the leaders meet, the summit has established uh, an institution called the Joint Summit uh, Working Group, which brings together the heads of all the multilateral organizations that that work in, in the re in the region. And um, you know, so having uh, PAHO and the Pan American Health Organization, ICA, the Inter American Agricultural. Uh, uh, or organization and other instruments at, uh, at our, dis the, the Inter-American De Development Bank, uh, the, the regional banks for Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, these are very helpful in ensuring th that uh, the, the decisions and instructions of leaders are pushed down to a tangible level where it makes a difference and engages uh, members of society. I think we've discussed the importance of engaging civil society so that the reflections uh, of the leaders, uh, uh, you know, also addresses the diversity that uh, that exists in in the region and the different degrees of marginalization. Uh, so the the, the 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 solutions are one uh, which help us to deal with the underlying uh, inequities uh, in the region and and achieve um, uh, uh, an an inclusive approach. And I I indicated in my own remarks earlier on that I I think, you know. Uh, if we if we don't step back and take advantage uh, of this you know the the, the crisis that has, is before us uh, and just deal with it superficially as a health and sanitary problem we're missing a real opportunity to deal with the underlying conditions in the americas that that have made us particularly vulnerable uh, at this at this time to this and other crises uh, man-made and natural that affect the region Thanks very much. Uh, Das O'Reilly, any thoughts on that as we look forward? Well, I think that it's it's an excellent point. One of the things we've observed across the region, and certainly, frankly, here domestically in the United States, is, um, uh, is our elements of this K recovery, if you want to call it that, um, in areas where we have significant uh, informality, uh, informality the economies or where there's um, poor access to services, whether they're public or private, um, you see that people are forced to make these very harsh decisions in order to care for themselves and their own welfare and those of their families um, uh, between going out and putting a meal on the table that, you know, that evening or um, keeping themselves, uh, following the kinds of social distancing uh, guidance that governments have, um, with some consistency, uh, preached, and that eventually um, the, these kinds of protections come, and, um, and it is a new wave of pressures on, on health services and the like. I think James is quite right. What we have to deal with the challenges of the, um, the pandemic, but we should look at it in a broader context. You know, the public health mavens say that vaccines don't, um, uh, don't make anybody, don't protect anybody's health. 
vaccinations do. Vaccinations do. And so what you have to do is think about every step along the way uh, that's required, the logistics, the training, the distribution, the equity of how these um, these uh, vaccinations are, are brought to communities. Well, that's not talking, I mean, yeah, obviously it's a public health challenge, but you're talking about the systems of how we bind ourselves together as societies. And, um, uh, and so, you know, it isn't a one size fits all solution and it isn't just um, a, a narrow response. We're given we're obliged to, but perhaps we're given an opportunity to look at um, deeper questions about who we are in this hemisphere and who we want to be. And um, and we need to look at those um, questions broadly so that we're inclusive in the solutions that we try to bring to the table. Thanks very much. I'm going to turn to Ambassador Estella. We're very close to out of time, so I'm going to throw uh, an, another question in at you and ask if, if you have any other thoughts you want to say. But I'll make one last round here. Uh, but Ambassador Estella, any comments on, on that recovery? Uh, I want to, anything from your experience as well, we have a question from the Ambassador of Suriname about sub-regional issues. Uh, Guyana Basin, obviously a lot of developments there, Caribbean. We have developments in a lot of sub-regions. How, how can uh, a, a hemispheric summit deal with any of these um, sub-regional questions, or should it deal with any of these sub-regional questions? What role does it play, based on your experience, Ambassador Isela, in that in that uh, in that area, as well as this one of the general more general recovery? Oh yes, of course. I think sub-regional issues are also important, but. Since we are talking about the summit of the Americas, you have to take into account that the sub-regional issues have to be discussed from a regional point of view. I mean, you cannot exclude those issues, but you have to uh, see how these issues affect the whole region. What do I mean? Let me put an example. Uh, this pandemic. This pandemic has shown us two or three lessons. The first one is we are not isolated. We have to face these challenges together. The summit gives us an opportunity to do that. Second, we have all over the region inequalities and we have to face that and to see what can we do again together to overcome that. Third, cooperation is absolutely essential to do that. Fourth, the consequences of the pandemic have shown us that affect the countries in a different way. And then you go into sub-regional issues, meaning that a problem, for instance, that affects most the Caribbean countries, an example, the tourism industry, has been devastated by, by, the, by this pandemic. That's a sub-regional issue because it affects mainly the, the Caribbean country, but it affects also the other countries. So you have a link between this sub-regional problem and the regional problem. The subtext of this is we should be able to identify as specifically as possible, the measures that we want the heads of the state to take in the meeting. If we are able to do that in the preparation, then we will have a successful meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that. I'm gonna to turn to Ambassador Lambert. We're right at the top of the hour, but for, for any final thoughts you have and, and specifically, Based on your experience, if there are any changes that you would suggest uh, that would improve the effectiveness of the summits of the America as we go forward uh, as a forum for hemispheric cooperation and integration? Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Steve. Uh, I, uh, I, I think that uh, in my re remarks, I talked about the, the qualities that the host can bring uh, uh, to the to the summit in the selection of the, the theme. and. 
uh, the, the uh, diplomatic skills with which they pursue it to bring together the, the diverse uh, elements within the within the region. Uh, so I, th I think that's that's very important. And at the risk of talking about process rather than outcomes, but it is uh, important. I think some of the the weakness the weakness that we see in the summit's process right now uh, is that one there's an absence of push down uh, in in the system and and we need a way there are ministerial meetings that take place in in the region but uh, they don't necessarily follow up with as much rigor and adequacy the outcomes of the summit the joint summit working group has worked to improve on follow up and and with the help of the peruvians we developed an articulate way for it uh, to do so and we need to continue to strengthen that process so the words of the leaders find a way to emanate but the most important reason for this is because the summits are so episodic taking place once every three years i mean half of the leaders around the table change from summit to summit so they don't feel any sense of impending responsibility when they commit to something that they've got to come back and defend what, what they did. Ecuador has put on the table uh, at the General Assembly in Medellin and subsequently the idea of moving up to two year uh, framework, the, the periodicity of the summits. And uh, I, I think indeed that would be very helpful in terms of keeping everybody's feet to the fire and addressing I mean, none of the other major summit processes around the world, the G7, the G20, ASEAN, would ever work on a three-year cycle. And one of the reasons is that the follow-up is very difficult to, to ensure and the, the, the world changes dramatically in three years. So I, I put that on, out on the table for consideration. Super. Well, thank you. That gives Kevin something to think about. But Kevin, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, of, among the speakers, and and I have uh, two things that I'm hoping you can address. First of all, trade is trade going to be part of the agenda going forward? What role should it play? And secondly, apart from the IDB America's Business Dialogue, how should U.S. businesses be engaging the U.S. government as we head toward the summit? What's the best way to do that? Let me answer part of the second one first because I sort of had that scribbled in my notes and makes it easier. Be a nudge. Um, uh, you know, I made the, the general point that by the time we get to the summit, um, focusing on your particular pet rock is not going to help. Um, but in this process of developing it, figuring out of the particular issue or constraint that you find um, in in succeeding in your business endeavors in the region and abstracting it down to principles and pushing us uh, it's perfectly fine. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that, that we have some fairly broad experience uh, as, as diplomats, this group that's been talking today. Um, Hugo de Sella would, I think, take pride in knowing that he is a nudge. Uh, that he is, he is uh, skilled at, at finding the right way to press his agenda. And I know that Ambassador Lambert would take pride in the same. I have certainly twisted arms, and Hugo de Sela in particular can attest to that over the last couple of years. Uh, that's okay. Uh, reach out to us and stay engaged. I, I want to hear your voices. Um, sometimes... I might not have the best answer that I, the, the most satisfactory answer immediately, but it doesn't mean it isn't registering. Um, and uh, that goes as well for dealing with counterparts who are going to feed into this at places like the U.S. Trade Rep and at, at Commerce and the like. And as far as trade, this is when that diplomat ducks this question uh, graciously and specifically. I am sure it will be part of the discussion to watch this space. We will be so. watching that space. That's a great note to end on. We will try to be making more spaces uh, for all three of you and for this summit discussion. This, I want to remind everyone, was the first of what we hope will be many uh, discussions to come. I'm not going to hold all three of you to coming to every single one of them, but we do hope that we'll have more of them. Uh, we're a little over time, but I want to give uh, Maria Selina uh, the opportunity if she would like to say any last words as my co-host here. 
Okay, no, thank you. It has been a, a very enriching session. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you again to the uh, distinguished speakers for basically honoring us with uh, their insightful perspectives and uh, for sharing learned lessons, uh, which are, uh, I think, very important to take into account for the success of the next uh, summit. And uh, among the lessons I would like to uh, to to recall basically uh, are, are the fact of uh, focusing, you know, on one theme, uh, the, the discussion help uh, in a very considerable way. In this case, it was a fight against corruption for the previous summit. Also the development of concrete uh, measures of mandates and the creation of, of a follow-up uh, mechanism with a plan for its implementation. And as Ambassador De Sela mentioned also, uh, promoting uh, cooperation initiatives uh, that involve the different stakeholders, uh, governments and joint summit working group institutions and also civil society. And of course, the uh, active uh, par and inclusive participation of uh, social actors, civil society, and the private sector who play a key role throughout uh, the summit process. Uh, I think uh, we can get out of this, you know, that the summit of the Americas is the result of a collective work among the different uh, stakeholders and the inputs received by the chair uh, within the preparation process is key for the decisions um, it will make. Uh, it was also stressed uh, the importance and the theme of the NICE Summit allows for the continuity uh, of, of, you know, the follow-up uh, of previous established mandates. Uh, the NICE Summit uh, of the Americas, as, as we have, uh, as we know, you know, uh, will be held in a unique context. Uh, this will require more than ever uh, the participation of the different summit stakeholders, uh, for which we hope uh, to continue working closely with uh, the summit chair, the U.S. Uh, st the United States government. Uh, I would like uh, to thank the council. I would like to thank you, Steve, uh, for generating uh, this special exchange. Uh, and for giving us the opportunity also to the summit secretariat uh, uh, to be, you know, in this business sphere and, you know, uh, uh, at event uh, with the participation of government, but also uh, the, the business sector uh, and uh, uh, the multilateral organization, uh, an area uh, so relevant uh, for recovery, the private sector and the business sector, also for growth and for uh, investment. I think uh, the, the challenge, uh, you know, of solid institutions uh, and transparent, uh, transparent regulatory uh, frameworks, uh, which are essential uh, for improving uh, the business environment in the region and investment attraction, as it, it is mentioned in the document and, and COA produced with the uh, Chamber of Commerce um, are key and uh, the participation uh, of uh, the private sector is necessary in all this process. Uh, and uh, to all of those who have been watching us uh, today, thank you also for uh, for you following these sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Selina. Thank you, Ambassador Lambert. Thank you, Ambassador Isela. Thank you, Das O'Reilly. We very much appreciate you joining us from the council. We are looking forward to working on the summit process. Uh, thank you especially to our members for their support of this process and we look forward to representing you as we go forward as well and working with you as the summit theme is developed. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Happy Thanksgiving to those in the United States. We hope you all have a great celebration and uh, we hope that you will join us uh, for our programs as we go forward. We're continuing the work and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon here at the Council. Thanks so much everyone.